Well, well, there's two things we're gonna talk about today. One, I wanted to talk a little bit about the exhibit across the street, The Queen Within, and how I feel like um, fashion and chess are somewhat related, and talk also about one of my favorite topics, chess problems. Even though I'm not a huge expert on chess problems and studies, they've always been uh, of supreme uh, fascination to me. And I also wanted to introduce somebody who is an ancestor of the great American player, Pillsbury, who unfortunately uh, died very young, but had an amazing chess career. He was the champion of the Hastings tournament, and he was just really far ahead of his time in the way that he played. Has everybody here heard of Pillsbury before? Yeah, those of you who've, who've played chess and have studied the history a little bit know that he was a really an American uh, genius. I didn't know that much about him, but I obviously have heard of like the Pillsbury variation, which is a variation of the Queen's Gambit. And I remember seeing a couple of his games, and then I read a little bit more about him, and I saw some, some games. So I want to show you just one fragment. One of the nice things about studying classic games is that players made more mistakes, so you got to see the illustration of some of the plans and tactics a little bit more frequently. And it's also just such like great fun to look at a game from so long ago and know that we're playing by exactly the same rules, right? It's been kind of thrilling about it. Um, I wanted to show you just a, a fragment of one of his cooler games here. Um, I can just go through quickly the whole game. So obviously opening theory has changed quite a lot, so I'm going to whiz pass through this, although we do see this, this kind of opening quite a lot today, just a semi-soft. And uh, I wanted to show you a little bit about the tactics here. Now already we have this move h6, which a lot of times when you have a light squared bishop on this diagonal, when you play h6, it seems like you're defending because now the pawn is not going to be able to be captured, but some serious problems can also result by playing this move. So it looks like it's a nice defensive move, stopping bishop g5, stopping the knight from coming there. But what are some of the potential problems with playing the move g h6 in these types of positions where your opponent has a strong light squared bishop, strong light squared bishop on this diagonal? This is actually pretty important, and it comes up in a ton of openings. I mean, this, of course, derived from a Slav, but it comes up in tarot cons, Frenches, all sorts of openings. What are some of the negatives of playing the move h6 in these types of positions? Obviously, when I teach beginners, I talk to them about how the move h6 makes luft, um, which means that if the files open up later on into the back rank, it won't be a checkmate because the king will be able to come out. But that's so far away because the position is still rather closed. G6 is weak. Well, yes, okay, g6 is weak. That's an excellent point that Ken made. So basically, one of the things is if you get a battery with the queen on d3 and we start hinting at checkmating ideas on h7, well, it's going to be harder to blunt them with g6. Not that g6 wouldn't be weakening anyway, but here it would just be almost impossible because the bishop would just capture that pawn on h6, right? So that's one of the major things. And there's one other thing, which I, I guess we'll find out soon enough anyway. So Pillsbury continued to develop, and he did put his queen on this square on d3. You see how that's putting a lot of pressure on black? Because if black were to move this knight, the queen would be able to go where? Yeah, the queen would be able to go to h7. And even though that's not necessarily mating, it's usually not going to be very pleasant, right? I mean, like, it's not mating because, for instance, even if the knight were to do this, so God knows why it would, the queen would come here, the king would come to f8, and now even queen h8 is not checkmate, but it's still bad, right? After king e7, queen takes g7, and we're just starting to, to pick off all the pawns. So instead, uh, the, the much more understandable queen c7. And then we see a move c5 which uh, Pillsbury certainly played for tactical reasons. Nowadays, we look at a move like c5, and from a positional point of view, it looks very suspect. But a lot of times in chess, the strategy and the tactics are in conflict with each other. We play a move that's positionally or strategically suspect, but it has a lot of points to it. Like We want to just like boom, 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 and get the initiative, so it's OK. But why do you think I say that that move c5 is positionally suspect? Somebody besides Julianne. 
I think you outright rate the rest of the class by like 500 points. So. You need to give other people a chance. <laughs> Ken? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and what is the, the real problem with the backward deep pond? More than anything, it gives black a, a nice square for what? What's, what square does that allow black to kind of? Yes, that knight could maybe come to d5 later. Of course not in the near future, because queen h7 is still on the menu. But that's why, strategically, not even looking at any of the pieces, just looking at the pawn structure, that's, and that's often what strategy is based upon. The, the pawn skeleton or the pawn structure, the move c5 is not desirable. But now Pillsbury just gets this like nice attacking formation with the knight on e5, and we still have this, this formation. One idea that White might have here, anybody, anybody think of an idea that White might have here if it was his move? There's a lot of ideas, but. What do you guys think? Isabel? Excellent. Very, very great. OK, so Isabel suggested distracting the knight on f6. We also call that removal of the defender or decoy. It has a lot of names. The reason it has a lot of names is because it's a pretty common tactic, <laughs> getting rid of a defender so that we can deliver a checkmate or take another piece. And how would you do that, Isabel? Did you give me a move in algebraic notation? Well, you, you got it, though. You must know, because you said you want to distract this knight with this knight. Yes, you did. Yes, you know. How can you move this knight to a square that distracts this knight? You just got to put all the pieces together, the pieces of the puzzle. Excellent. Knight to, don't listen to Julian. He's a fish. I beat him yesterday in one minute, Chas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was bragging to the class that I developed some one minute chess theory. I'm not really that good at one minute. You know, Grandmaster Ben Feingold or Hikaru Nakamura are legendary at the form. I'm like rather slow, but I get faster the more I play it. And one thing I realized playing uh, the talented player here, Julian, is that we, uh, we need to play, when we play the one minute chess, we need to play like the advanced variation against the Carol Khan and the French. That's it. <laughs> use, use that trick at home. <laughs> you want to leave, the, I like the closed positions because you just move your pieces really quickly as white. You have a little bit of initiative, and then your opponent's just under too much pressure. So anyway, knight g4, great idea. And I think that Pillsbury had that in mind as well. So bishop takes c5 was played. Now knight g4, not as strong because the king on f8, there's an escape square for the king. So Pillsbury had another idea here. Um, there's actually a couple of good moves here, which just goes to show how great the position is. But I really like his move. And this shows one of the other dangers of making a weakening in your castled king position so early in the game. So what to do here as white? Everybody think about it for a minute. So of course the idea of bishop c5 is that after pawn takes c5, queen takes c5, getting rid of one of black, white's most powerful pieces, right? See that? And now it's like, I don't know, this is still probably pretty good for white. I feel like everything is good for white here. But this is not as good. I mean, I would consider something like, because black is up a pawn. I mean, I still think that maybe something like this is a bit dangerous, but with the idea that if you capture this on f6, and h7 will still be up for grabs. Um, so even this could be dangerous. Although maybe black can just hang on with a move like queen f5, even though that looks really dangerous. I don't see an immediate refutation to it. Queen c3, um, and then just queen g5. and Yeah, I mean, I still feel like I'm hanging on compared to other variations. Are you going to trap my queen? I don't think you're quite trapping my queen, but maybe you're taking on f6, and that's going to be, you mean like after this, h3, and you're taking on f6? But even here, you're not quite taking on f6. I mean, you are, but I can take with the queen, and that's not what you wanted. You definitely wanted more than that. So 
that was Black's idea that maybe somehow he would get some play by playing bishop takes c5. So thoughts here for white. Mm, G4, I don't like, it's not my favorite move. This is one of these positions where you already have so many pieces attacking that a lot of times you don't need a pawn to attack. Like, it might help, but you might have an easier way. Like, uh, usually when you're castled on the king side, you're trying to attack with pieces, not with pawns. Now, there are plenty of exceptions to that, especially at, like, the highest level where they always know how to break the rules. But G4 is just, like, not my top move because it's a little slow when you already have like all these guys kind of aimed and ready to go, and only one defender, you might look for something more direct. And all these loose pieces also, all that's a signal that you might be able to do something like right now. And that's an important ability for a chess player to develop. And probably one of the things that really separates you from your next level, your next milestone, is knowing when to uh, think more. Pretty simple, right? I mean, in chess, you have to ration your own time and you have to decide when is, an, when is a moment in the game where you have to play, play automatically because you're ready, your instincts are good, and when you have to sit back and say, like, this is it, I need to look at all the captures and checks and really analyze. And that's what the, the great players are so good at and why you of, all, often see the top players in the world, the elite players, playing a lot of quick moves, they've got their opening prep, and then they might go into an extremely deep thing. It's very typical. The problem is after knight takes g4, we're actually threatening checkmate ourselves on h2. And also, I mean, this is really an important point because sometimes people forget this. Queen h7, it's not mating, right? And we do have just king f8. So that's, that's the difference. When the bishop was on f8, Isabelle's idea, this actually would have been mate. Now it's just a check, and the problem is now you've got a mate thread on the menu, and queen h8 doesn't do anything because we just go to e7. So. Not the best, but obviously always something that you would look at. Knight takes f7 is actually a good move. Um, and the idea, Julian's idea is that now this is kind of like a desperado sacrifice, which means in this variation where we took on c5, our position was pretty good, but we were down a pawn. So desperado means, well, we're going to lose this knight anyway if we take on c5, so not, why not get a little bit of wood for it? And that's not just a little bit of wood. That's a crucial defensive pawn. So white's position is just going to be fantastic right here because not only do we, we got the two bishops, the king is in, in terrible shape, and we have material equality, whereas before we had a position like this, but we were down a pawn. So that's definitely one way. I mean, I, I have to say I like Pillsbury way even better, though. The move he played here was even was even more crushing. Knight f7 is good. If he sacked the bishop on h6. Excellent. Ken um, says that did he sack the bishop on h6? And yes, he did. And that's what I was foreshadowing at earlier. That when you play this h6 move and you see that your opponent's prepping for an attack, I mean, obviously, don't be absolute about it. There's plenty of situations where h6 is a key defensive move, but. It also can be a negative defensive move. So you kind of have to weigh the pluses and minuses. So after bishop h6, uh, if black takes, what is the key point? What was Pillsbury's main idea here? And this is where um, our little acronym, that if you've ever watched any commentary I've done with Grandmaster Sarah Wan and Ashley, you will know, I always like to say LPDO, which is a really cheesy acronym for loose pieces drop off. And what it's supposed to mean is that whenever you have a position and you have some pieces that are loose in the position, meaning unprotected, your alert should uh, go up, right? So you should be thinking more um, sharply about captures and checks. Just queen where? G3. Queen g3 check. Excellent. Very good. If queen to g3 check, then we can't go to h7 because the bishop's hand. Bishop's hitting that square. So our only options are f8 and h8, and then what would white do? Does anybody say? Just knight g6, exactly. Just knight g6 check. And what kind of tactic is that? Hmm? What kind of tactic is that, Isabel? 
a discovery attack, and for Halloween we like to call it a boo attack. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everyone. So the idea is that the knight on g6 says boo, or discovers an attack on this queen, which is unprotected on c7. Exactly the same fate if king f8, right? Then we also play knight g6 check. Why is knight d7 check not as strong? Isabel? Because the queen can take the knight. Right, the queen can just take the knight. Um, so it's, it's just so sad when you see somebody play a brilliant sacrifice and then they just screw it up in, in the end because they get overconfident. So it, it's, I, I like to always point out, well, why not that? So in the game, what did happen? I think uh, this, oh, black played bishop takes d4 instead. So Winnower saw that g takes eight chicks was going to be pretty ugly. And so instead, he took on d4. And after queen takes d4, unfortunately, the attack is still extremely strong. Queen comes over to the attack. And you know the, the problem here is that white hasn't sacrificed anything for this attack except for, what, one pawn? I mean, and it just like, your king is in uh, really brutal shape. So knight d5 was played. And now what did white play? Not queen g3, because notice the knight protects the queen on c7 now. So this queen g3 idea no longer wins the queen, right? Yeah. After takes, queen takes c7 is guarded by this knight, yeah. right? So instead, what happened? Oh, sorry, here. Here we are. Excellent. Queen to h6, and here we see a very common tactical pattern. Why can't black take on e5? This is a pattern that comes up all the time. It's a really important one. Um, and I talked about like how the smother mate, it's kind of hard to see if you have to figure it out on your own. But if you've already seen it, it's almost like a building block. Like, you know, it, almost like a pawning game. Like you already see it and it's a shortcut. So here there's a mate that you should all have memorized. I know you got it. Who else has it? This is a checkmating pattern that we should all have memorized. Okay, he's got it in the back. No problem. Well, one thing to do is always, is always get your candidate moves in order, right? Like queen h7 check just doesn't seem like it leads to anything. So before you start going down that rabbit hole, make sure, because you might say, oh, queen h7 check, at least his king's in a little danger. Maybe I'll play rookie one. Very important, before you go into that rabbit hole, say, do I have any choices before that? Most chess players make errors by not considering enough options, not by miscalculating something five moves down the main branch. So therefore, you got to check the other check in this position. What's the other check in this position? Isabel, besides queen h7 check, what else do you got in the menu? Bishop h7. Bishop h7 check. Yes, you must look at all checks, especially in attacking positions. This forces king to h8. Now what? Well, now we've got our, 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 our plenty of options of boo attacks, right? There's one, how many of them are there? One, two, eight. Eight, but only one of them is good. Although, to be fair, we can always reverse. Um, if, for instance, if we made, the, made a wrong one, we can always uh, reverse the decision, right? You know, we could just repeat once. And then go and then and then find the correct one. Be careful. I don't. I have to say I don't agree with the always repeat philosophy because sometimes you can get get confused and you do it twice and then suddenly it's a draw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do it twice. Suddenly you do it three times accidentally because you did like the first move twice, but the second move three times. I don't know. I mean, I guess doing it once is okay, but try to be like err on the side of safety. Because by the time you're thinking about, wait, did I do this two or three times, you've wasted the time that you would have saved. That's the issue. I have had somebody, I've done it, somebody definitely did that, at least I think twice to me actually, that they had a winning position and they decided to repeat to gain some time in the clock and they did it like one too many times. It happens, it definitely happens. 
Wait, I think the play, one of the players was Nakamura, actually. When he was really young, obviously. I mean, he was like, he was still like, he was still really strong, but he was like, you know, a few hundred points lower rated than he is now. Yes, bishop g6 is the correct one. Now why bishop g6? Because then after king g8, we have a maiden too. So this bishop guards this key square, f7, right? So our maiden too, Isabel? Well, where can you check? You know it. I know you know. <laughs> exactly, see, you know. And then after king f8, there's maiden 1. Where was I trying to go when I played bishop g6? Exactly. See, and there we go. This is our one of our most common checkmates in chess. Queen right against the king, protected by the bishop, right? Or protected by any piece. And that, that's just an extremely common checkmate pattern because, I don't know, it just happens all the time that you have a queen on h6 and a bishop on that diagonal. At least it happens all the time if you're an attacking player. Sounds like a... <laughs> so after knight d5 instead, wait, what happened? So queen eight, wait, queen h6 happened and then f6 instead. So that's a better defense, f6. And now Pillsbury played this other fine move, f4, trying to get more pieces into the attack. So as you can see, this is a, what, those of you who listen to my commentary also know what I like to call a move like f4, after pawn takes e5. Yes, the rover, the idea is that this rook is going to come into the attack. And that's going to add the, the brutal final, final uh, bullet here. Now, the best move for black is probably, I mean, we always think about attacking with the queen. But the other thing is that defend, defending with the queen is really key. So probably the best try is queen g7, hoping that white will somehow trade queens. Um, of course, that probably wouldn't happen. And white would instead play queen h5, hitting this rook, and then just continue with the plan if the rook moves, trying to get this uh, rook into the game with the rover, right? And that just looks really hard for black to defend. Just, you know, you can't move your king. You can take the knight, but then rook g3, and you notice how the queen can't move because the king would be in check, right? So that would be pretty bad. So instead, rook e7 was played, but now, what do white play here? So he's now, he saw the rover idea, so he's trying to protect with his rook so that his queen doesn't get snagged. So instead, uh, Pillsbury found a way to win even quicker here. Yes, knight to g6 is a winning move. Because now, if rook g7, where is the uh, mate in two, someone? Somebody else? <laughs> I know you're still working on uh, chess notation. Yeah, yeah, it's... Queen h8, and then once king comes to f7? Uh, the queen to uh, mm -hmm. f8. Exactly, right? And this knight is protected. And this is kind of an unusual mate. But the knight is protected by the bishop, so it's just mate. And, I, don't, I mean, there's nothing really else. It's kind of a pretty mate that if the rook comes to h7, just because it's kind of unusual. You don't see this checkmate that often. <laughs> kind of a little variation on a smothered mate. And I think, uh, yeah, this, just, this was just resigned at this point, yeah. Game was resigned. So just a cool little game. So how many of you actually got a chance to go see the exhibit across the street, The Queen Within? Isabel did, the women did. Big shocker. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a great exhibit across the street called The Queen Within. It's at the World Chess Hall of Fame, which I'm on the board of. And people are really coming in from all over the world, actually. So I, I was like doing a little refresher in Pillsbury. Um, but uh, um, people have come from all over the world to see this show. And this is one of my favorite pieces in it. And the idea is that they're talking about archetypes of the queen and the nine archetypes of the queen for, based on Carl Jung and trying to show like the parallels between creativity in chess and creativity in fashion. Obviously, this is a very creative piece, right? I mean, whoever thought of this uh, obviously had a pretty grand imagination. 
and it's funny because I was talking to somebody who was very interested in fashion. And they were telling me about this dress and everybody's fascinated by how it was made because nobody really knows exactly how they like made it look so beautiful and elegant, but yet still had like holes in it, right? <laughs> like obviously that's gotta be really hard to do. So they were, they were saying that they think that there were, there's a bones in it. Like I guess that's like a, a seamstress term for you know, some, some things inside it that make it hold up, right? And uh, I, I was like, well, is that good or bad? And she was like, well, that's definitely not as good. It'd be better if it just like stayed up by itself, right? Because there's something extraneous that helps it stay up that you don't see that makes it kind of like less artistic or something, right? And that reminded me of chess problems and chess studies, which are basically compositions that are created um, to show the power of the pieces, to just create something beautiful, and to help people train to be better tacticians and more creative in chess. So they're not positions that come from a real game, right? But they're still useful for becoming stronger. So I thought of that when I, when I saw this. And let's take a look at position. OK, this is just such a stunning position. I mean, this really could come up in a real game, right? I mean, all you've got is the two kings and two pawns. This could easily occur in a real game. White to move and draw. So this pawn is going this way. So it looks kind of dire for white, because it looks like the black king can stop this queen, and that white is too far away to stop this pawn, right? So you look at this position, you take a few, few seconds, and you're like, oh, darn it, white is just lost. But white has an amazing draw. All right, so Ken? So King G7. So King G7, and what, what would you guys expect black to do here? H4. So yeah, black plays H4. And now what should white do? Julian? It's King to F6. So King to F6. So it still looks bad for white somehow, right? This pawn just keeps going. And now if black were to play, well, what do you think black would play here? Because now it's starting to get like unclear. It seems like there's two valid options. So yes, yeah, say black were to play king b6. Now, what would white do? Hmm? Well, if we play king g5, then after h3, basically you're not catching up with us, and we're just going to take your pawn. So that looks lost. OK, now king e5, let's see what the difference here. If king e5 is played, now the cool part is if black takes on c6, what does white do? Just king f4, and now we're in the square of the pawn, right? So the pawn can't queen because we just capture it. And if black plays h3, what do we do? So you want to play king d6? Is that what you're saying? And then, oh, not e6. <laughs> king d6. And now after h2, you play what? Uh, exactly. And now when you queen, we queen at the same time, and it's a draw, right? And there's no way to skewer anything, right? And if you play king b7, what do we play, Isabel? King d7. Beautiful. King d7. And now we're actually the first one to check. Woohoo! Yes, go back a few minutes. There is one other main variation. So instead of king b6, yeah, you want to look at h3. Now what do you guys think black, white can do? Now after king to e7, if, white, if black plays h2, what happens? Again, we play c7, and then if king... If queen, we're queening at the same time. And if king b7, again, we have king d7 or king d8. So the, the amazing thing about this position is just like from a visual point of view, it just looks like white is toast. But all in this, this position is the essence of double attack. That's what's beautiful about this position, that double attack is one of the most important principles in chess. 
um, because we're always trying to attack two things at once, and it's a tactic that comes up all the time. But here, this is actually a double attack, if you think about it, because we're, we're, uh, we're trying to go over here, and we're trying to go over here at the same time. It becomes more directly a double attack later on. Like in this line, now you can really see how it's a double attack. Because when we play king e5, we're threatening to play here, closing in on the pawn, and we're threatening to play here, stopping them from getting our pawn. So this is a great example of simplicity. And I think that that's what's interesting in chess, that there, in chess problems, there's like these two divides. Like I'm a noob to chess problems, but I do notice that there's, it seems to me that chess problems and studies, there's the ones that people like because they're so simple that you wouldn't expect something so cool to happen. That's the beauty of it. And then there are ones that are so absurdly complicated that you can't believe that there's something so simple in it. And that is also a principle of fashion that it's like you either take something that looks really minimal and it looks amazing, or you take something that has all sorts of divergent elements, like look at these dresses or look at this um, installation by an artist who is actually in town, Hideki. Um, this is one of the, the, the coolest rooms in the show. It's just kind of like fantastical, whimsical installation of, of dresses. These are both dresses right here. Um, that you can make something that's like kind of absurdly complicated, and yet it still works. Um, and an example of that in chess, and this was actually a position that um, a, a women's, a many time women's champion, Anna Zatonsky, showed me. Now, that, yeah, this example, this is Maiden One. Believe it or not. Good luck, guys. <laughs> Try and find the Maiden One. And be, be sure you have it. Be sure you have it. You saw it before? Yeah. OK, go. Do you, do you actually remember? Don't say. Don't call it out. But do you remember? Yeah. OK. Um, it's white. White. White to move and win. So many bishops. Good point. <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's let everybody have a chance for this one, because, because it is just a maiden one. So I want everybody to try to figure it out. Elizabeth. D8 is not mate because you can't do it. Oh. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> because it would be check, right? That's why this position is so hard. It's like so many random mates that seem like they work. Um, anyone else? Be s anybody else had some idea? That was your idea too? Can you imagine it's so hard to find a mate in one? Of course the reason is because there's, I mean, I, for somebody, you know what would be an interesting project for Julian since you already know the answer? is how, count how many checks there are in this position. Because ba basically, that's why it's so hard, right? There's so many checks. Because in order to find checkmate or to find the best move, I always tell my students, look for all the captures and checks. In this position, there's just a lot of checks. Uh, many, many checks. I haven't counted them myself. Two, three, four. Is this the pawn Yeah, I guess. I guess those are different moves. Um, yes? Knight to c6, you mean? Well, yeah, that's not mate because the bishop can take. Yes? Bishop d6. Bishop d6 is not mate. Because I can just play king f6, right? I looked at that one too. I think that was the first one I saw as well. <laughs> it's like, it's like so messy. And then I, and you also look at this one. And then they can come back here. It's like, that's an easy one. Oh, I'm surprised nobody gets this one. That's a really, that's a really typical one to ask. But then there's this. And, oh, no, no, sorry. Sorry, this one. There's bishop, bishop b7. And then there's also, um, and then there's also knight. Take, take. Oh, it's not letting me take with a knight. I think I have to make some setting. But if I, but if you make a knight, I think I have to change some setting that takes away auto queen. Um, I don't know how to do that. But if I make a knight, then um, black can go to where? Yeah. Then black can go king e8. So that's not made either. But there is a mate. I know, right? It's an absurd absurdity that such strong players are spending so much time to find a maiden one. It took me a while, too.
Because I, I definitely, as it, when you're studying problems, you always look at like the, the, the pawn takes c8 equals nine. Like that's like kind of the first thing you look at. Because a lot of what problems and studies are, many times the solution has something surprising or paradoxical in it. And that's one of the reasons why people like it. Because there's that feeling of like, wow, I wouldn't have expected that. Just like holes in a beautiful couture gown. Yes? No, that one. Oh, I see one. You see it? Yeah, what you got? Bishop H4. No, Bishop H4 is wrong too. Let's have to put the rook in the, in the middle. <laughs> so, did you get the number of checks yet, Julian? You're still working on it? Yeah. It's a lot. So working on the number of checks, right? While somebody else gets the answer, look, we got a lot of mis mis tries here. We tr did we try knight? Did anybody suggest uh, knight g6 yet? And also, there's the other bishop taking it. <laughs> These bishops are really getting in the way. All those light squared bishops. I Isabel's right. How did that happen? <laughs> They've all been promoted to bishop. That's right. A realistic position, indeed. <laughs> yeah? Uh, this, wait, wait, you want to go where? Queen, this, then, then I can take with the other queen, which isn't pinned to the king. Yeah. There's a lot of pieces in the mark. But you're getting closer. You are getting closer, warmer. Yeah? I resign. Come on, guys. We're almost done. All you need to do is find a mate in one. You've solved much more complicated things than this. You've got to look at all the checks. Like I said, this, this really brings into uh, to release what I was saying before about how a lot of times it's moves that you're missing that are right in front of your face. It's not missing a 20 move variation. It's missing an option that you had on the very first move, yeah? Queen A3. Woo, you got it. Queen to A3. <laughs> but and, look at, and look at how she got a hashtag. <laughs> Why is she the only one who got a hashtag? Oh. <laughs> she got, your mom got the hashtag. Because that's also, it also means checkmate. Before Twitter was popular, the hashtag meant checkmate. And also number sign. Exactly, and the number sign. OK, that's another one. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's an example of a position. I mean, you just never expect a mate in one to be difficult. And boy, when we get into mate in twos, those can be incredibly difficult. I think we're going to look at a, a couple of mates in twos in our next class, where we're going to do a little continuation of this. And we're going to talk about some more uh, Simple beauty and very, very complicated beauty as well. Mm -hmm.